Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I don't know, it's not terribly hot today. No, it's not too bad. We got some cloud coverage. Had some rain this past day. Yeah. So, But we're uh, we're getting ready for a heat wave this weekend. I don't know if you know I, about this, Nick. I don't check the weather that it's, often. On Saturday, they say it's going to feel like 115 degrees in New York. That Really? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Get out your misters. I guess so. Yeah. What what, what have you been up to this past week? Uh, not a whole lot. Oh, I can finally announce that my dumbbells that I designed for Peloton, I don't know if I've really talked about them on the podcast, um, won a Red Dot Award. Congrats. I did not pay for the for the submission <laughs> thank fee. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty stoked on that. I'm pretty proud. Um, the you also won the Course Aim Seven Award, correct? I was listed for the uh, treadmill Wait. on the Course Seventy Seven Award. Okay, so Red the, Dot only did the dumbbells win Course Aim Seven, or no, was it like? I don't, co- a whole cohesive thing. I don't know if they were submitted. I don't think they won anything okay, so for just Core 77. The, the treadmills. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if they were submitted or not. But uh, Red Dot has this thing where there's a limited amount of designers that can be on an award. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Whereas I think Core was a little bit like, hey, put the whole team right, on there. Right. Um, so, yeah, because I did a small part of the treadmill. Uh, literally just a small part, the neck of the treadmill. <laughs> Uh, but the dumbbells are my baby. That's awesome. man. And, um, so yeah, I have them pulled up on the YouTube. You can check them out. I feel like we've talked about them a little bit, but you know, it's, we've done 62. This is 63, 63, number 63. I mean, we might as well talk about them again. I mean, I think they're really cool. They have a very unique style. They have square weights to them. Yeah. So they don't roll around. Yes. And I don't want people to think that this is some like arbitrary, like I just took two Apple TVs, put them on their sides and then put a handle between them. (laughs) That's not arbitrary at all. I mean, it has a purpose. It doesn't roll around. So, I mean, a big part of the whole Peloton um, thing is that they're inviting people into fitness who have never really exercised before. You know, they they might be first time, right? you know, and you see a lot of this, like I, I follow the Peloton hashtag, especially when I worked there, I was following it. And it's like a lot of people, like I have these new fitness goals. And now that I have the Peloton bike, like I'm really going to go for it. And, right. You know, so you think about there's, there's some exercises that require, you know, in the case of the treadmill, they have these boot camp classes, which you get off the treadmill and you're using weights and whatnot. And there are exercises like the ones that you do on the floor where you're using the dumbbells for as like push up blocks. And if you have those hexagonal ones, I mean, yeah, you're going to roll over all over the place. I've done workout classes where I've, you know, I've done those with the hexagon ones and I was very concerned all the time about them just like rolling over. (laughs) Um, but the, the thing that I really wanted to draw from was was the home as an inspiration. And so what I did with the dumbbells is I wanted them to look like upholstered pillows. Like I wanted the button that's in the middle that has the weight size right. to look like the button. And so it actually depresses slightly in the middle. Um, and then you have the, the dumbbell end, which is the pillow. Um, because, you know, another part of the Peloton design philosophy is to be something that people are not ashamed of. It's not your typical exercise equipment that people are like hiding in the basement or in the third floor, you know, wherever. Um, so yeah. And, uh, obviously I need to, you know, I love shouting out, but I've got to (laughs) shout out the team. So Jason poor head of ID, Mark Cruz, senior designer, Lee Hendricks, who actually, he took my concept, um, which, you know, is pretty much what it is today, but he built out uh, the entire line of weights. So took Uh, my 15 pound weight, which is what I handed over and then translated the design to all the other weights. So that's, that is a lot of work. So big shout out to Lee. And then um, Heidi, 
uh, who Reed has mentioned on this podcast many times, engineer who engineered the weights, and then Ben Schultz, the project manager who went to Taiwan and figured out how to get these made because nobody makes weights like this and it's very difficult to figure out how to get them made and how to get them made well. I mean, that's that's a very difficult. Yeah, it's like one of the hardest parts of design is just figuring out how to make the thing. Yeah, so uh, huge shout out to the, to the team uh, for their support. Uh, in getting this made and getting it made so well. Did the did the treadmill win a red dot or just the weights? The treadmill won a red dot and so did the shoes. They actually okay. designed a pair of running shoes Yeah, so, and uh, those also got a red dot. I, I've probably talked about my uh, opinions on red dot before, but... <laughs> I, I, I think hey, reg- regardless, I, I think you did a great job on design and I would give you a award for whatever it was. I designed the resistance bands. They were submitted, did not get a red dot. So, okay. So they got, they have there, some parameters. There's not, it's right. not just like, oh yeah, you paid, here's your award. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> but yeah. Whatever, Nick. No, if no, you no. Had, I, I mean, if you had I'm a not, company backing you. For sure. If, if someone else is paying for your red dot, might as well, right? Yeah. Listen, um, I got those red dots and I got those 4.5 star 99 reviews on Amazon. I've never gotten any awards. Hey. So like, congrats <laughs> to you, man. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a contentious issue. The whole idea of awards because they... There is this whole payment process with well, them. Yeah, and, and I think the the problem that I have with Red Dot is that you have to pay after you win. Like you pay to submit a, a certain amount. I don't know the number. I right. Would, I would guess it's around, you know, two hundred to five hundred to submit a submit a design. And then, I believe, and my research is not. You, you should double check me on this, but I believe you had to pay somewhere around like two thousand dollars to kind of to accept the award. Mm. So it's like, Hey, you won. And instead of, instead of giving you a prize, you actually have to give us a prize. (laughs) Anyways. Yeah. That's my little tangent. That's my, my little opinion. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I did not have to deal with any of those payments. So So you're um, golden. You got, you got the best of both. worlds. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, amazing design. Congrats, James. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I don't have. I don't think I have any updates this week. I've just been hanging out, kind of fixing up the studio. I don't know. You designed this red dot award-winning pin. Yes, no. buy a pin. Oh, I wanted to um, shout out people that have already bought a pin. Oh yeah, and may- maybe I'll say the names in shotgun style, and you'll just be like, "Thank you," you know. Like, uh, okay. Right? All right. Um, Joey V. Thank you. Freddie B. Thank you. Andy A. Thank you. Thomas R. Thank you. I have Jenny D. Thank you. Louis G. Thank you. Jason S. Thank you. Grace B. Thank you. Nick H. Thank you. David U. Thank you. Park. Pa- oh boy. Perik Schitz S. Thank you. I apologize for those <laughs> who I've messed up their names. Uh, Carlos T. Thank you. Tyler A. Thank you. Graham W. Thank you. Daniel B. Thank you. Alejandro A. Thank you. Matthew K. Thank you. And Michael R. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hey, uh, thank you very much. We, we do really appreciate the support, and yes. we, we hope you guys can rep the swag and, I don't know, show it off to your friends. Tell yeah. people about the, the podcast. Also, call us up and tell us how your names are pronounced. <laughs> uh, yeah, if if I apologize for that, <laughs> De- definitely to. Par- I mean, it, par- it is not to toot our own horn, but it is really cool to know that. I mean, these we have an international fan base. Yeah, no, I've I probably sent majority of them international. I at least at least a good half, I think. That's that's just my my. Gut that's reaction. cool. Thank you so much, guys. We um, really appreciate the support. But yeah, get get a pin. Minordetailspodcast dot com. Um, I suppose my whole Chipotle burrito thing is kind of lost on the international community. <laughs> they have Chipotle in no. other places. Where is it not international? I don't think so. I don't think they've got. I don't think it's gone. They definitely have burritos. They definitely yet. have burritos in other. Places. They know <laughs> what a burrito is. Yes, uh, but do they know what Chipotle is? We should. We should do a McDonald's analogy. But I have oh. no clue. I mean, what is it? 
I don't know because you could you, you could, could feed, feed a family. You could feed multiple generations of a family with twelve dollars at McDonald's. <laughs> that sure. dollar menu takes you a long For way. Sure. Twelve items off the dollar menu. Yes. Um. So, uh, boop, 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 boop. design news. This design isn't, news. This isn't really design news, but I thought it was a pretty uh, a big thing that happened this week. Uh, and I mean, disclaimer. So, so this is. Elon Musk announced his progress on Neuralink, which mm-hmm. is the uh, brain implant technology that will allow us to control computers. Yeah. Um, and I think we just want to disclaimer that we have worked in this space before, so our opinions might be influenced by our knowledge of this. But yeah. um, I don't know. Did you Have you read anything about it, James? Or I could just give you... Kind of with a summary of Elon's presentation. I yeah, I like glanced at it. I I really didn't pay too much attention to it. Well, as you know, I'm a Elon Musk fan. Yeah, um, I can smell it on you. I can smell the Musk. <laughs> you can smell the Musk. I well, <laughs> I the only thing that irks me about Elon Musk is his presentation. Oh, skills. he's a terrible presenter. It's, I I feel like any one of us or any of our listeners <laughs> could get a better presentation than Elon Musk. Probably. Uh, but regardless, I think he's a smart guy and he's done a lot. Um, so Neuralink is his, I guess it's been around for two years now. Um, and the live stream yesterday, you, we will link to it so you can watch it. Um, kind of did an overview of all the research they've done. And uh, essentially what they're doing is they created very fine filaments, fine threads. You know, they're made out of some sort of metal or some sort of, you know, polymer that are inserted into your brain via this very high-tech robot. So I, it sounds kind of science fiction-y and kind yeah. of dystopian, um, but they've tested it out uh, on animals and even at the end, Elon Musk said that tested it on a monkey oh. and that the monkey was able to control a computer. Cool. Which is kind of crazy. And, um, oh, did they have to choose such a cute mouse? <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, animal testing is a whole nother topic, but right. Uh, I mean, better test on an animal before a human though. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. The, the thing was, is that, uh, I mean, I, I am a fan of just, technology in general and i'm always you know all for progress and and trying to i would would love to see you wearing like a sports jersey that just says technology technology or i i'm a fan of technology in general um but you know you i i do the vr thing you know i'm i'm i love it yeah um and you know knowing about elon musk's venture for the past two years it's always been something that like I've like, it's something that I ask people like, Hey, would you ever get a brain implant for, to control your, your device? Right. And what is their general response? Well, everyone usually says, no, of course not. Yeah. But my, my, my thought was always like, yeah, I, I would do it. You're, you're I don't know if I'd, I don't know if I'd, early I'd, adopter. I, I don't know if I was, I would be a, the first one. And I don't also know if I'd be like early adopter, but I would definitely be, second early adopter yeah but let me tell you after i watched the presentation i was much more scared really yeah because they they showed video of the surgery happening i guess on uh, on a mouse or something um they do have to drill a hole into the skull right and then you know they take these threads and they stick the threads into your brain right and there was video of this like the needle going into the brain sticking the thread i'm sorry to get graphic but it just like changed my perspective on it. And I was like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about this yet. Yeah. And, and you know, I think we're going to have to, we're going to have to do a podcast about the work that we've been doing. Right. At, which kind of also, uh, long, alters our opinion somewhat. It's because, along the same vein because this does seem just a little too invasive for my taste. And at least at this stage, right. But, Maybe it's something that over time I could warm up to, but I just think, I I don't know. So, so to, to calm everyone down for a second, Elon Musk is definitely gearing uh, Neuralink at least initially towards uh, 
me- medical, right. right? Right. Like people who have lost people limbs, who are already getting surgeries, right? Like people who this can really change their life and, you know, give them a limb back or give them, you know, f- like you, the, you know, he talks about like, you can unparalyze someone with this device. Right. You can, you know, just kind of reset, like if someone's paralyzed from the neck down, this could save them. Yeah. Um, so like that, that kind of scenario is great. Like, you know, this can be game changing. I think the scenario where it starts to become a like optional procedure for the general public where, Hey, now you don't have to, you know, com- you know, use a computer uh, mouse or a keyboard. You can just kind of think it, um, that that's the kind of dystopian or, or future, like, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions in that scenario. Right. Um, and he even goes into talking about a little bit of like communicating with someone on a, on another bandwidth level, mm. essentially telepathy. Mm. If someone else has the neural link, you can kind of communicate with them th- almost in the way that phones communicate that much data. So like, huh. instead of like talking, you would have more of a, a, transfer of knowledge in a way yeah. which is like insane and then and it, so and then another another point that got me scared was that elon musk talked about not only can you output but you also the device will also be able to input into your brain oh. so that's how you would communicate back and forth with in- someone interesting so that definitely got me a little bit a little bit cautious yeah i mean especially because it's something that is essentially a part of you once you install it. Yes. Now I will say that the, the part that is installed is only the, the threads and the sensor. So there's no computing power that's installed into you. The computing power power is like connected behind your ear or something. Mm-hmm. I think there was images of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you could easily disconnect. Like you could usually take, you could easily take the thing off and all you would have is just plastic and metal. Right. In your, inside of you. Yeah. It just, it like, it tends to remind me of that one Black Mirror episode. Have you seen? I, I you know, is, I've not seen. Is this seen a show you have watched? I have seen the exact episode. I know, I, I'm, I'm just excited because I, I never know TV or movies. So I'm just really excited <laughs> that I have seen this episode. Are you talking about the one where it's like a VR headset, but it just connects to your eye? Uh, I think your, it's. Your temple? Yeah, it's like I think it's called Redo or something and it it's like filming oh, all I've the seen time that one too. and you can kind of like rewatch things right. and and eventually doesn't the guy just like rip it out of himself? I I've I don't remember. There's probably actually there's probably multiple Black Mirror but, episodes about this. But yeah, I mean, it's it is super interesting technology. I'm just I'm not I, I don't know. You're like, much more hesitant on it. I'm I'm pretty hesitant on it, but We'll see where it goes. I I like I like Elon, Elon for championing certain industries. Yeah. And getting excitement around those industries. For sure. For sure. I feel like he's really brought I mean, you have SpaceX too and it's just like this guy's he's the, he's the modern day Iron Man as they as they say. <laughs> he really is. He's just not as as witty and as <laughs> charming uh, or playboy esque, right? Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. Speaking of 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 a little bit more time for it to <laughs> to warm up. Yeah, we wanted so. Uh, yeah, I, I just had to come off of that that topic that design news because it's just a heavy topic. I don't know. It's, yeah. Uh, no, but but for uh, the topic this week, we kind of wanted to think about. Or, or talk about this idea that I've had, which mm-hmm. is, well, you know, it's not, I mean, it's just a thought I had is the value of time in design. And what I mean by this is like, I feel like we're missing this element of distillation in design where we design something in a concept phase and then we just let it be. And I'm not talking like, sit it around for a couple of days. I'm talking like months or years mm. where it just sits and lives with you and you get to feel the prototype and decide whether it's good or not. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, I, I kind of feel like maybe this is like slow design or I don't know if there's a word for it or a, a thing for it. So what you're saying is that like you see there being some value in being able to, design something 
and then let it sit. Right. So, so that you're not just pushing it out the door. Yes. Because the entire industry does that, right? It's all based on deadlines. It's all, Hey, we got to get this done quick. You know, I'm sure that if anyone had, if you work in the design industry, that's how it is. And really that's how it is in the entire world. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants stuff now. It's our mm. instant gratification culture. Right. Um, and I think design might suffer from that. Um, so, you know, I, I've had a few examples of this in my own um, designs. I, I feel like just recently I've been working on a, on a light for gantry um, and maybe been working on it for about, I don't know, started it maybe nine months ago. Mm. Um, and the, the great thing about gantry and I haven't really talked about this at all. Uh, I've been kind of keeping it under wraps until, yeah, this is the first time we're hearing it on the podcast until recently. I've, I've done a little peek peek, a sneak peek on, on a little bit of my Instagram yeah. um, recently. So, uh, yeah, maybe this is like a, a little, this is, an, this is like a weekly update. This almost. is a minor details exclusive. Exclusive. This is design news. Of course. I, I always got to give the minor details exclusive. You guys always get the best news first. <laughs> um, so I've been working on this light for mm, six to nine months now. I forget when I started it, but, uh-huh. uh, the great thing about gantry is that since it's 3d printed lights, their, their production time is so quick. Yeah. Like they can, you can come up with an idea and get it produced in like four months. Like that's unheard right. of in the traditional, right. Uh, in traditional industrial design and manufacturing. But, um, you know, for me, that's like so fast. Like I, I I'm, I feel like I need to sit with a, a yeah. object for a while. And so I did, I, I kind of designed this light and we can talk about it later, maybe on another podcast, but, um, I got the prototype in that they had engineered and I, I just had it for two to three months just sitting there using yeah. it, seeing it every day in my room. And over time I, I kind of understood the form better and understood the things I needed to fix on it. Mm. Um, and if it had not been for that amount of time, I would not have understood those things. Right. Because when you first get it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. You know, maybe there's a thing I need to tweak here. Um, but other than that, like, let's let's ship it out the door. Right. But as you sit on it, you start to realize the smaller nuances of it, and and I felt like that helped me finalize the design. Yeah. Now, I know that recently you've, or more recently, you've also been talking about jasper morrison's design philosophy and like how does this fit into that because i feel like this is something that the jasper morrison thing was something that you adopted yeah i i don't know if i mentioned i mean i think there so so i read the book uh jasper morrison a book of things and i think he has a few other books as well that i should check out but Mm -hmm. um there actually is a part in there and I'm not sure if I've told this on the podcast or not, but he he designs this side table that looks like a wooden crate. Right. Have, have you, was this what, what you're thinking of? I yeah. Um, Do you know what it's called? Is it just called like crate? Uh, I don't know. Or like crate side table. I'll try crate side table. Yeah. Um, and I apologize if we talked about this already on the podcast, That's but it, right? it's still a good story. Yeah. So. The the story goes is that Jasper Morrison, I guess he was like moving into a new house or something, and he used this old wine crate to move all of his stuff, like a box, right? Yeah. You have a bunch of boxes when you're moving, and um, he unpacked everything, and he kind of kept this crate next to his bed. I think it probably had some books and stuff in it, so he just kind of set it up and used it as a nightstand, um, and he just left it there. And over time, he like he realized that it actually was a really nice design. Hmm. Um, and so I think a furniture company approached him and was like, Hey, we would like to do a collaboration. Do you have any designs? And he was like, yes, I do. I have this, this wine crate. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he designed this wine crate for this furniture company and it costs like, you know, $300, which is, 
it, which got a lot of criticism because all it is is a wooden box that you could buy it. You, you can know. get it for 150, is that pounds? Uh, or is that? Probably pounds, 150 pounds. Yeah. So I don't know what that is. Oh. $187. That's okay, not so, bad. So not as three. But, but James, it's not bad if if it's a nightstand, like a nice design nightstand, but this is just a wooden box. It kind of does look like you took like a, dra- like a drawer out of a dresser and put it on its side. Right. So he definitely came under some criticism for the fact that it was just very high priced. Yeah. But I think there's a, there's a lot of value in the story of, I guess sitting with an object and letting it distill and understanding what what it needs and what it doesn't need right because i think what it doesn't need is almost more valuable than what it needs mm-hmm. right yeah i don't know if you've ever had any experiences where you where you had a chance to let a design sit i'm trying to well i mean i've certainly let my bottle opener sit for yeah. okay. for like a year so can you give me a can you give any thoughts on that? Like, do you feel that since you've let your bottle opener sit and distill and you've just had the prototype sitting around, do you feel more confident in the, de- in the design or less confident in the design? Uh, I think I feel the same level of confidence. I think what I mostly feel about the bottle opener is I, is I beat myself up for not having produced it, like not having produced it when the, when the iron was hot. You know, just like getting it out there. Oh, that's, so, that's a, because that's, I think that's a drawback to this method. I think, I think what I more often find is that I'm frustrated by long deadlines. Yes. I, I would much rather, because I feel like there's this moment where you start to question your intuitions, where it becomes counterproductive. Right. I think that is the flip side to this entire thing. Yeah. Where you can well, first of all, yeah, there's two things there. Like you can create a prototype and you're really excited and you, you know, you push really hard to get the design like to a physical point and to a place where you can use it and test it. And then you can either sit on it and, and sitting on it almost, almost can make you stagnate. Like right. it, it, it's a much harder to push it out the door three months down the road than it is the next day. Yeah. Cause you're kind of already in the goes the go mode and getting ramped back up to like push the design out the door can be tough. Yeah. No, I find that especially tough and that's why I'm always interested in doing things in a short time frame and like something that I can be very iterative with. And I mean with the bottle opener, it was around the time that we got our printers. Right. So, I was able to just be very quick and iterative with it and that was really invigorating and I felt like I was able to like produce something that I was proud of pretty quickly, like just off of that juice. Yeah. And that is, doesn't always happen. Sometimes you run into like ruts. One case, uh, and I think I discussed this in a prior podcast, and this is not something that's produced, but it's something that is certainly out there enough for people to see is the helicopter that I designed that both Derek Elliott, you know, animated and Andrew right. Brace is going to build. That helicopter took me a really long time to figure out because like I had done multiple iterations of it and just was completely unsatisfied. And it kind of like stopped me in my tracks with my helicopter series because I was just so frustrated that I wasn't able to achieve the design that I wanted. Wait, so how many helicopters, toy helicopters did you do? Uh, that one was 19. And was that, was 19 the last concept? 19 was the last concept until I did, I did a few cars and then more recently I did, um, helicopter 20. Oh, interesting. Uh, so so, so 19 did have this distillation period. It did because it was just like, yeah, it was really difficult to, to figure out like, cause I had just this whole idea of the propeller underneath the carriage and something like, and then contained somehow with the feet. Right. And I, it was like, it was literally like a year later that I figured out by like arcing down, I should pull it up by arcing down the legs that they could then become the feet. Mm. Um, right. And cause I was trying almost everything else. 
Uh, and I, I, I want to actually do a post about it. Uh, here's the Derek Elliott animation of it, but it was, it was a more difficult to design design to figure out than the other ones. And I feel like it got the benefit of time because I do feel like this is the strongest of the series. I would hundred percent agree. I think this is my favorite as well. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that is the one case that I can think of right. where time was, time was on my side. Yeah. I also, I think Jasper Morrison also had another story in the book where he talks about, um, working with a client on a, I believe it was like a furniture piece and it was years. It was mm. like, f- I, I don't know what the, how many years it was. It was like two to five years. Yeah. Um, and he just talks about it as like, hey, this is something that we just took time making. And I think there's a lot of value in that, too. When you, right. when you think about something that's been thought about for five years, that that may, that has a lot more weight than, some, than something that's been designed in two months and produced. You know? Right. Yeah, I think like, you know, unfortunately, you can't always do this in your day-to-day job. Right. But my my kind of feeling about certain projects is like, if they're not coming to me, then I don't want to force them. Yeah. And like, if I have the luxury of putting things on the back burner and just having them sit in the back of my mind to like work on, cause that's the thing is like that helicopter would constantly, I would revisit it just in my head a lot. Right. And you know, eventually it kind of emerged. Yeah. And I guess like, this doesn't even necessarily have to apply to, the physical prototype as well. I, I know, I mean, the helicopters were just concepts. Right. Um, and then, you know, I think that we all have these concepts that we've done and we're always thinking back on them like, Oh, you know, I really should get around to that, that one concept I had. Right. You know, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, cause you, you had done your, like there was a bottle opener that you had done. Yes. I mean, so this was, this is an example of, letting something sit and realizing that is it's actually bad design. Mm. Um, so I had originally designed a, a bottle opener. Is like, that if I, I go know, three years ago, if I go far back enough, if you go far back enough, you can find I'm, it. it's good. It it's going to be a, long. it's going to be a dizzying pace for those watching on YouTube. Um, so I had, when I was living in Texas, I wanted to manufacture a product start to finish just for fun. Yeah. Um, and bottle opener seemed simple enough and I just started going at it. Um, and so I designed this bottle opener that also had a wine cork on it. And the bottle opener also had these like three, uh, metal, I guess, legs coming off of it, which acted as the bottle opener. So in theory, you could open three bottles at once. Um, I never actually got it to work. We could probably do two bottles at once, but I never got three. Uh. Um, but I, I did actually get a sample made. Like yeah, I actually paid for tooling. I'll oh, scroll up a little bit. Am I? I actually oh, paid, yeah. I actually paid for tooling to get it uh, casted and everything, and so I got to the manufacturing stage, and you know I let it sit and I tested it and I played with it and I realized that the design was just too extraneous. It just had too much going on. Right. Um, now, can I ask you when you were in the process of doing all this, did you? Were you feeling satisfied with the design at any point or were you always like slightly unsatisfied with it? I think I was always a little slightly unsatisfied. Mm. Like it never, like it felt like a lot of it was there. Like it felt like the design was like mostly there and maybe I was concentrating too much on the details Mm. where like I was like, oh, let me get this filler right. Let me get this geometry right. Um and never really seeing it as a whole, maybe. Mm. Um, there, it ha- you know, it had this wooden handle on it. Also, just from a manufacturing standpoint, it was difficult because it was multiple pieces. Right. And so taking a pro- like having your first product be multiple pieces is definitely a, a more of a challenge than just a single like metal piece or something like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that was like an example that I had got it to the manufacturing stage. And was just using it, letting it sit, testing it, seeing how I felt about it. Yeah. And eventually realizing after, you know, nine months of development that, and, and dis- distillation that this is not the right design and I'm not proud of this. Interesting. Now, ironically, I think that this might have been the thing that like 
piqued my interest in your work like was really watching was watching this series like watching you go through all of this and it also was kind of inspiring to me because I was like oh you can just like make things if you want to right and so I mean that's a case where like even even if you're doing something and you don't ever make it like there's maybe intangible benefits for sure I learned so much about Alibaba and I, I also I also got scammed on this product. Really? Yeah. So um, what happened? So I was I was sourcing the metal uh, piece, you know, yeah. this kind of trident or three legged thing, um, and you know I was on Alibaba like searching metal forgers fabrication. I'm not exactly sure what I was searching. Yeah. Um, trying to find. I mean, you know, I. I was completely new to Alibaba. Like I was just trying to find someone who could make this thing. Um, and so I sent out a bunch of messages to people and got some quotes back. And I think they're pretty expensive. Like I'm trying to recall how much it was, um, a, a piece. Mm. They're, they're probably like, uh, I don't know. I had to look back like $6 a piece to make. And then, uh, you know, getting a sample made was, you know, eight hundred dollars or something like that yeah which is you know like to spend eight hundred dollars like that's a commitment right like you better yeah. make sure that design's good before you drop 800 bucks on it right um and then i had one supplier come back to me and was like oh yeah i can make this for eighty dollars and i was like oh thank goodness i can finally get something made for eighty dollars instead of eight hundred dollars and you know, I was like, okay, perfect. Let me just get it made and get it shipped. Right. Um, and so they were like, oh, okay. So do you have the Western Union app? And oh. I'll, I'll say the details and stuff. And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. So oh, I, like, no. I downloaded this this uh, Western Union app, which is what money transfer. How do you, yep. what do you say? Um, <laughs> and they sent me um, the details of where to send it. And I think I originally sent. 80 bucks to the the correct name but the wrong country so 80 dollars went into the middle of nowhere i eventually got that that 80 dollars back okay because i think western if no one picks up the money at western union you can get it back right but, but after like three months yeah and then they you know like the, the guy was also super pushy he was like we need this right now yeah um and so I was like, okay, okay, I'll get it to you as fast as I can. Yeah. Because, you know, it's like, I don't want to lose this good deal, right? Um, and then I sent it to, I believe it was uh, Cameroon, which is a country in Africa. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, some some guy in Africa got my $80. Never, nice. heard, never heard from him nice. again. Nice. Um, so, yeah, there's a little, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know, tail. Yeah. Well, advice. you you inadvertently funded his bottle opener project. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's uh that's crazy yeah i mean it's interesting because you look back through that and it looks like you had a lot of support for that bottle opener even though you eventually decided to nix it yeah like you were gaining momentum gaining steam gaining followers well yeah and i think i that mean not just because of the bottle opener but people were like enthusiastic about it i think that's also an important distinction to make is like just because people like what you are doing online or, mm -hmm. or appreciate it or, or comment, um, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good design. Right. Um, and you know, people, you know, I put up a fancy render of the bottle opener and it looked cool. Like it looks kind of cool. It's got like, you know, these metal pieces and wooden pieces and like as a material or as an, actually we have it right here. Oh, just bring it out. Crack it out. For the video. Uh, if only we had some brewskis. Yeah, there was a comment on our last video that was like, take stuff down from the shelf and play with it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you are the designer, right? So you might get 100 likes on something, and and that might be good. But at the end of the day, like, 100 likes, you know, doesn't... It's, it's just an image. Yeah, so. can we talk about this a little bit, a yeah. little bit longer? Because okay. I... Because, you know, my final feeling on this was yes. that... It, it didn't know what it wanted to be. It didn't know whether it wanted to be a sculptural object or a utilitarian object. Right. I wanted it to be everything. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the flaw. I think that was the Cause that, that underlying was my, flaw. That was my final analysis of it was like, I, I like 
I like parts of it, but as a whole, I felt like this is not like the handle gestures towards something that I want to put in my drawer, but the the metal is like is, is, is a sculptural thing. Right. So my feeling was like you gotta do something with the handle that makes it less of a handle and more of of like some sort of like sculptural piece right um and then i i remember trying to round off the top of the handle and then just thinking that it might be a little bit too phallic <laughs> that's that's always a question in your yeah. designs that's always one make sure if you it'll happen it'll happen if you there, don't ask that question it'll happen i would like to think that there are designers out there I mean, it, uh, I think it soats us being one of them that was that were looking Embraced that are looking it. for the phallic. Well, you know, whatever. What, it's a good question to ask, and whatever your answer may be, <laughs> you can decide. But it's up to you whether you think that's valuable or not. Right. Um. But yeah, it's it is the thing that I feel like is valuable with in terms of time is being able to chew on something before you even start to design for it. Right. And, oh, I was going to say, um, so there's the artist Sebastian Razariz that we've mentioned on this podcast before. Right. Um, he has this technique where he sketches out concepts and then pins them up to his wall um, in his studio. And so on his studio wall, he has, like, hundreds of con concepts and, uh, like, just coincidentally like i was inspired by his sketch wall to make my sketch wall mm. on previous episodes uh, yeah in the background um and the way he talks about his sketch wall is he kind of puts it up there and takes down all the bad ideas every once in a while mm. and over time you know there will be several ideas that stick up on the wall and don't get taken down because uh, you know, he takes them down, you know, every month or so. And it's like, ah, oh, this one's still good. That's this super still cool. Good. This one. And you know, if it's still good for a year, he might put it into, put it into a project. You so. don't get rock hard abs like that. Oh, without James looking up, without having some good ideas. James you know what I mean? A swim, swim. Oh man, photo. he's chilling with Marcel Vonders. <laughs> he's cool in my book. Um, so yeah, I want to hear what, what you guys have to think about, if you ever had a chance to let a design sit and distill and whether it was good or bad. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough one. Um, I, it's a tough one. Cause, cause I don't think the projects that you have to let sit won't make money. So, and often like you don't thing. have the luxury of, of being able to let something sit. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I think my final thought is like, if I'm working with a client, I would much rather the deadlines be tight than than long and but if I'm working on my own projects I would like to have that just like think of a kernel of something and just and then just like chew on it in the background. Yeah. I feel like that's how m more of the the furniture industry industry works where it's independent designers submitting concepts to furniture brands and working with furniture brands and not not everyone's like this, but in some way, there is a little bit more distillation in that fact. Yeah. As opposed to maybe the more traditional uh, plastic and hard industrial design. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, let us know your thoughts. Hop in the Discord. Check out the Discord. It's always popping in there. Link in the Instagram profile. I feel like I'm getting addicted to Discord. It's almost more than Instagram. It's a might, lively, lively conversation in there. This is another tangent. I feel like, I feel like no matter what, you're you're always going to be addicted to something. We're always going to have a a, a, cru a crutch, a crutch. Yeah. What am I trying to say? A uh, a crutch, a crutch, a cr a crush. I don't know. You're always going to have a crush. <laughs> Who's your crush? Like if, like if you took away Instagram, we would feel so we would figure out some other meaningless task to fill our time with. Right. Whether it's like video games or something. Yeah. I found myself doing that. Like if I don't spend, if like, if I like am very diligent and don't spend an hour on Instagram, well then I'll just spend another hour on like, you know, watching YouTube. Well, like I was saying, you know, in, in the modern era, we've removed so many of the daily tasks from our lives. Oh, right. That I feel like we have to fill it with something. Yeah. And whether it's video games that make you relive some of those tasks that, <laughs> that are 
ancient <laughs> ancestors used to perform. Right, like Sims, you could make someone sweep the house. Or yeah, or, uh, you know, or, yeah, just like connecting with people. I mean, the Discord is great because because it's not so much about signaling. It's not so much about like, hey, there's this thing here. It's more, it's it's more poking and prodding and, and getting to some deeper answers. Yeah. And uh, it's, yeah. it's I, super interesting. I appreciate all the people in there. Um, yeah. And also like we, ha- we have some people are always sharing their work too. Yeah. And uh, specifically Tim Zarkey. Oh. We're, we're we're a big fan of Tim Zarkey, and he he likes to share his little sneak sneak peeks before are, he shares it to Instagram. We are so like, getting it's a perk. It's yeah, a perk. we are getting exclusives on Zarkey. We're getting Zarkey news. Yeah, we're getting uh, Zarkey tips and tricks. Yeah, uh, he's he's sharing a lot in there. Um, should we get to some questions? We should get to okay. some questions. So. Uh, oh, if you had a question, send it to minor details podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And then we also have a Google voicemail, which no one has sent in a voicemail in, Come on, in like three months, but that's okay. one six four six four nine four forty eleven. 494 I still have the number memorized. So nice. Um, so our first question comes from Mal GV and he asks, Hey guys, two part question. Can you break down the final deliverables you usually give to clients when freelancing? And any tips on interviewing slash getting to know your clients? Hmm. Um, two part question. So let's, what, what are our finer deliverables for clients? Um, design CAD. Yeah. I, w- I would say certainly a CAD file. Yeah. May, uh, probably a rendering some, some CMF suggestions. Right. Yeah. I, I would agree. So like usually what I do is I give them you know, a step file or if they want native CAD, I can probably provide that. Mm. Um, that's more of a situational dependent thing, but certainly some sort of CAD file. And then I usually do like a specification document, Mm. which is, is kind of like if if it's for, you know, we have different clients where sometimes we'll work with a client in a company, like go into their office and that's a little more cohesive. Right. But if it's like a remote client, maybe it's a shorter project definitely I includes a document that's like, Hey, this is the design that we've all agreed on. And this is, you know, it's going to be this color. It's going to be this finish. So yeah. CMF. Um, it's also going to function this way. It's going to feel this way. It's going to connect this way. Right. Um, it's going to work this way, et cetera. So when you say feel this way, like, are you talking about like buttons and things like that? Or are you talking CMF? I guess when I said that I was thinking like snapping, together okay whatever that is i don't know <laughs> I, I don't know if i'm it just will <laughs> snap it will crackle it will pop that's right um yeah i think those two documents are usually my deliverables of course it always depends i mean sometimes you're doing concept sketches and that's yeah it. i'm mostly you know it's it is interesting that my freelancing career i feel like i've mostly just worked internal yeah. in in companies and so i feel like you've done one or two like out, outside yeah, projects. but a lot of those are still like I'm going to meet with these people, and so like the the final like handoff is in person, mm. and so like a lot of those things are just described verbally. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of value in that though. Yeah, um, but any tips on interviewing, getting to know new clients? What do you do, Nick? Um, you know, I think there there's the two sides of the coin, right? There's the going into the office and freelancing inside the company. Mm-hmm. And that is a little bit more of the client is interviewing you. Yeah. Cause you're almost like a employee in that, like more of a contractor type yeah. of scenario. Um, the other way around is, is doing the, the remote or the clients that are more coming to you as like a, uh, a, a consultant or something like that, where maybe you are interviewing the client to see if their project is, is something you want to take on. Mm. Like maybe you are the one, you know, deciding. Um, and you know, certainly like I've gotten a lot of inquiries of like, Hey, I have this idea. I'm this business person and I want to work on this project and I like your designs. Uh, can we chat about it? And you know, Mm -hmm. that's like a pretty average, like email for like a, a new client. And, um, I, for, for a while I was like, yeah, let's do it. Like, you know, hop on the phone and like chat about it. 
Um, and, and at some point I realized like, this is a good amount of time I'm spending on these people who, you know, I, I chat with them on the phone. I spend a lot of time talking with them, you know, understanding the process. And then I get to the point where I give them a quote and then they realize like, Oh no, I don't have the money for this. Like, oh. you know, I was looking for someone, you know, maybe more junior level or, right. or something like that. Um, and so it's like, oh man, I just wasted, you know, three hours. I don't know if it's wasted, but I spent three hours talking with this person and, and forming a plan. Um, you know, I think I learned something. Oh, from, I believe I learned this from Haraf, the graphic design studio, mm. which we talked about back on the Core 77 conference episode. Yeah. Um, where right up front in the email, you kind of give like a baseline just to like set the, set the playing field. Like, Hey, I'm super interested in your project. I'd love to hop on the phone call and chat. Uh, but before you know, I, I just want to let you know that I do have a baseline, a project, a, a baseline fee mm. of X amount. Oh. Um, and if that's comfort for me, comfort, comfort, comfortable, com, com, comfortable, comfortable for you, then I'm happy to talk. <laughs> Uh, so I've if been you see comfort in that, so it, <laughs> if this proposition is like a couch to you, it's get, it's getting a little hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a technique that I've been using, and I found some su- success with it. I can't talk anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, James. Give me your thoughts. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that's good because recently I had a situation where I went out. It was like. I, I feel like I was teased by this client twice you met, you because, met in because they never, because I never actually got signed on to a project. Okay. And so I went out and met with, with these, this company. Right. And, um, it seemed like all systems were go and I don't think that they realized how much I was going to charge them. Mm. And even after explaining like why, and like what I was going to do for them right. and how I was going to save them money in the long run, you know? <laughs> well, there's uh, that old quote of like, you think good design is expensive. What about bad design? Right. And so like eventually I just, you know, I was, I just didn't get the job. Yeah. Like, and it was, it was really frustrating because I had taken the time to like establish that personal relationship. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, if, you know, and there was no, it was this weird, like, you know, you're going through this in between person and you can't talk to anybody directly. And if you could probably everything would be sorted out right. and fine. Right. But it's like, you know, I come across as this like pompous, like young designer of like, Oh, I'm worth this much. Like right. pay me, uh, you know, because I'm worth it. It, and, it can be a little bit like that. Like yeah. I, I will caution you that you definitely, if it's an email, it's much easier to phrase it in a very specific way. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely understand that fact because I actually have had a scenario where it did go bad like that, mm. where it was like, "Excuse me, like, what do you, who do you think you are?" Like, yeah. saying in the first email how much you charge as your baseline. Like, I I haven't even told you about my project. You might. It was like it was like that kind of thing. Well, and in that situation, do you feel like you you? avoided some like a bad client For sure yeah. yeah i mean if someone if i write a nice email that's like hey you know i just want to let you know this is my baseline i hope you understand yeah and they come back with like excuse me like i've talked with all these big so I, oh I, okay i, I don't and, want to get and too we much also into it, want to clarify that when you write hey you want to emphasize the crackle in the hey when you say it <laughs> the, hey <laughs> um <laughs> You but, can even link to an MP3 uh, uh, little sound bite that'll do that for you. Um, um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for those questions, Mal. Um, you want to get to this question? You want to you want to read this one? Yes, uh, Tati sent us a question. Hey, I know you guys hate PDF portfolios, <laughs> but my previous job does not allow me to publish any of the work I did there to online platforms. I worked there for two years and a half and keep struggling to present my portfolio poten- to potential employers since I'm stuck with the PDF format. Very soon, I'll be working on my portfolio again to apply to junior positions. I would like to know if you guys have any suggestions. Should I try a mix of medias? 
how many pages for a PDF format, what content, let me know your thoughts. All right, so so Tati has work online. I, I, I checked out mm-hmm. her online Behance, but some of her work is stuck in PDF format because her employer doesn't allow her to publish it online. Yeah. Um, which is kind of a, a, a weird scenario because what in, in my head, it's like if the employer didn't want you to share your work, they wouldn't even let you share a PDF of it. Right. In my opinion. But that, yeah, that is strange to me. I wonder what kind of like, if there's any legality to, them preventing you from showing the work right like the the medium thing is interesting like hey you can do it in pdf but not online i mean i guess that it makes sense obviously because online can be very you know it's public whereas pdf would be more private sent over email right but i think the solution here and or at least one solution here is if you would like you can build a website and have it password protected yeah so that that would be the solution that i see Yes. If you want to have the online experience, if you want that polished online thing and be able to update it. Right. I also wonder if there are pieces of a project that you can show publicly that you couldn't show privately or or privately that you couldn't show or yeah, I, not like you're no. saying like maybe show the process, but not the final product or vice versa. Maybe. Oh, like, I mean, obviously like maybe the iteration is something that they don't want shown, but right. the final product is fair game. Right. Cause the final product's probably on Amazon or something. Like yeah. That. Right. I, I just don't know. Like, it's hard to say because we don't know what you're, what kind of products you're talking about. And if it's like something that hasn't even been produced yet, which then, you know, again, like I could understand why right. it's not acceptable to put up, but yeah, I think password protected websites. Um, and when it comes to the PDF format, uh, I like to keep things simple if I have to do that and just do eight and a half by 11 PDF and, you know, like not, not sweat it too much. Yeah. Keep it simple. If you're going to do PDF, um, and please don't upload a PDF to be hands. Thank you. <laughs> I just wonder what, what they mean by a mix of medias, like, a, like a mix, like, Hey, should I send my website and a PDF of like the extra projects to, to an employer? Yeah. I think the thing, the thing that I like that I've said before about Instagram is it's like this supplemental portfolio. Like if you can really round out who you are as a designer, like if you are not able to show certain things, but you do have a web presence, obviously like you send your website, you send your Behance, you also can send these more confidential things. Um, I, I guess that's I think, not a bad option. I, I think that's a fine option. Yeah. I, th- I think if you want something more polished, I would go the, the password protected website route. And again, if you're going for junior positions, definitely show, emphasize the process. I mean, obviously like people are interested that the, the process leads to a good final product, but what you're proving as a junior designer is your abilities. And like, you have to, because you don't have a lot in your portfolio to show for, you need to show, illustrate your process as much as possible. Right. Because that's what people are interested in. For sure. Um, yeah. I think that was good. I hope that helps Tati. I hope so too. Tati's on the discord. Thank thank you for the question. Um, shout out of the week. Yeah. It's funny because, uh, we answered a question from Mal and he's actually the one who made me aware of this designer, Sebastian Barrett. Uh, I, I would guess a 23 year old design student in Paris. And, um, this person I'm guessing a, he is, is posting, uh, mostly personal projects. It says here. Right. And, and their Instagram handle is at S E B A S T I E N dot B A E R T. And it just, as soon as I got to this page, it just struck me like how, how nice these projects were and how he's got a really refined taste. Unique. They are very, very clean and simple, but yes, very, very unique in their form for sure. Like this, uh, this light project, these, these, uh, these little light guys, 
yeah. I thought were just these, the, I should say lamps. That's the, that's the more common terminology <laughs> and not light guys. Well, well, gantry actually refers to their, their lamps as lights. Oh really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so these, these are these lamps that I guess are inspired by, um, shallots. Oh, like onions. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess like the one I'm looking at is like, what you, it's like a, almost like a plunger shape, but right. then, then there's a light box kind of put onto it. So I assume that you can adjust it so that it's like, yeah, taking the box up and down. And so one, so it seems like one of them is for the height of the light and the other one is, is for is, tilting is more tilting. Yeah. The other one's tilt. Um, and I just, I'm very just like, impressed by the aesthetic i think it's a very refined aesthetic i also for think a student like this that, is good that the presentation of the work is really nice because it just you know it highlights the work right it's very um, clean i love this this speaker the speaker concept and sebastian writes why should only chairs have legs it's got it's got those big elephant legs yes that's fun um so yeah i just wanted to shout out i you know we don't often shout out students and, but I think that when a student is doing work this nice, they they deserve for sure a shout out for sure. And uh, so yeah, check out Sebastian Barrett on Instagram. Um, awesome. Uh, let's see what what we got. We got to wrap up here. Wrap it up, Nick. Wrap it up. <laughs> subscribe to iTunes. <laughs> Rate that five star. <laughs> like, <laughs> subscribe to YouTube. <laughs> Thumbs up, YouTube. Hit the alarm button. Follow Spotify. I don't know what you do on Google Play. <laughs> Intro and outro, Kiyoshi the Kid. But uh, yeah, as always, I'm at Nick B. Baker. And I'm at I Draw and Receipts. Peace out. Later. <laughs> I'm a beatboxer. <laughs>